This is the Straight Truth Podcast, biblical answers to difficult questions from a Christian worldview. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of the Straight Truth Podcast. My name is Richard Caldwell, and today I am missing my sidekick, Dr. Josh Philpot. He is in San Diego. He is attending the annual meeting of the Evangelical Theological Society, and uh, but I am very happy to have a special guest today. Uh, with me is Dr. Tom Pennington. Tom is the senior pastor at Countryside Bible Church in South Lake, Texas, which is the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, Tom, if my math serves me right, you've been there for 21 years this, uh, as of this October. Before that, Tom served for 16 years with Dr. John MacArthur there at Grace Community Church, and uh, Tom also had a ministry with Grace to You. Um, We've asked Tom to come on because we want to talk about a new book that he's just written. The title of the book is The Biblical View of Abortion, God's Heart for Life in the Womb. Tom, we appreciate you being with us today. Well, thanks, Richard. It's such a joy to be with you. Appreciate you and your ministry and uh, obviously excited about the opportunity to, to deal with this topic. I was telling you before we, we started filming this, um, you know, your book is outstanding. Uh, I've taken time over the past few days to read it. And one of the things that, that I really appreciated is the pastoral perspective that runs through the way you dealt with the subject. So I just, if you would, just take a moment to talk about why uh, you wanted to write this book. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it actually came out of a sermon series, which I, I love that idea as well. But if you would just talk to us about the idea for the book and how it came to be. Yeah, well, I, I love the fact that you picked up on the sort of pastoral overtones because that was really the context in which this came to be. Like you, I'm not a controversialist. I don't live my life dealing with all the issues out there. If I do, uh, if I take a break from the verse-by-verse -verse exposition of God's Word, it's because I think there's something in the life of our church family or in the larger culture that's affecting our church family that I really need to speak to and address. And, and that's really where this came from. It didn't start as a book at all. It started because in the summer of 2022, when the Dobbs versus Jackson Health case at the Supreme Court and the ruling came down on that, there was a whole lot of discussion in the larger culture. A lot of people, obviously the larger voice, decrying uh, any limitations on abortion and recognizing the sort of pressure that comes on the believer through the world system that Satan has created, the, the pressure to think in, you know, in, in terms of the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age in which we live, I just felt like it was important to say, look, I think we all agree that abortion is wrong, but let's, let's sort of buckle down and, and reassess why that's true, both for ourselves, for our own consciences, and understanding, as well as as we have this discussion and conversation with others. And so that was really the birth of it. Um, the, the decision for the Dobbs versus Jackson Supreme Court case came down, and I think I preached these two messages, that's how it started, two messages on abortion about a week and a half, two weeks later, just to help our congregation think about this issue. And uh, af over time, as the issue continued to swirl around the culture, some of our guys started saying, you know, that should be a book. That should go into print. And that's really where it came from. But the the tone that I'm so grateful you sense, because that was my heart, really was pastoral because that's that's what was happening. I was trying to pastor our own congregation as they walk through this this contemporary issue. Yeah, I love that. And and so this is this is information orig originally first, you know, given to the church. But also, Tom, would you say this is a book? for the church. And, and by that, I mean, this is, this is something to equip God's people to think biblically, as you say, the biblical view of abortion, to think biblically about this subject. Um, and if that is the case, if this is a book, you know, first designed for the church, I mean, this is a subject that has been talked about for years and years and years now. There have been books written about it. Is it possible after all of this discussion and after all this, you know, all of the, the trees that have died in the interest of the subject as these books have been put out, is it possible that God's people don't have a, a firm grasp on this subject from the standpoint of Scripture? 
Yeah, you know, I think uh, that's a great point. Uh, there has been a lot written. Much of it is older. And of course, things have changed in terms of how the abortion industry functions, in terms of the larger argumentation, the flawed arguments in favor of abortion. Those are different today. There are some that have been added. Um, in addition to that, I just think, you know, I'm I am one pastor trying to shepherd my congregation, but as I looked at the resources that were available, what I saw were some really helpful resources, but none of them seemed to marshal um, the entire flawed set of arguments that are in favor of abortion, nor the, the best of the biblical arguments against it. There were, again, great resources that sort of punctuated several potential arguments but I, I didn't feel like there was this this overarching resource that really went through the entire issue in as much detail as possible. Yeah, I, I sign off on that 100%. And, and one of the things that impressed me about the book, Tom, not only its pastoral tone, but as every, as I've come to know you, everything that you, you do, I appreciate this about you. It's thorough. It's careful. Uh, it's accurate. Uh, even, even you're dealing with the biblical text, of course the view you have of the Word of God, which is it is the Word of God, uh, the way you've handled those texts uh, demonstrates your reverence for the Word of God because we're, we're not just going to proof texts for the purpose of making a point. We're going to look at those texts carefully and and actually allow them to speak to the issue. And I just thought you did an outstanding job with that. So one of the things I appreciated about the book is it though you are taking up the biblical argument against abortion, you're very thorough and I think fair in evaluating it historically, culturally. And one of the things you did that was interesting to me is you actually started um, not only with the history uh, of of abortion, you know, throughout the ages, but you also were careful to define terms that we just take for granted. So you you were careful to to define, you know, embryo, fetus, abortion, even even just our initial thoughts about abortion. Take a moment and talk about some things that you point out there and, and why you thought it necessary to do that? Yeah, well, as you know, there are so many uh, debates that rage across uh, the internet, across our culture, and most of them are uh, mostly heat and very little light. And I, I think a lot of that begins by we're talking past each other. We're not dealing with the same terms and language. Sometimes, sadly, that's intentional. It's a, it's a sort of bait and switch that, that goes on in argumentation. Other times, it's just a lack of pausing to say, let's make sure we're discussing the same issues. And so I, I just felt that that's important. Again, back to the pastoral function, a, a lot of our people, the people in our churches, they haven't really taken the time to define those terms themselves, and they're thrown around in the larger culture. And so I felt that was important for me to be careful in the presentation uh, of the truths that I was going to make in my messages, but also, and in the book, but I also felt like it was crucial for the people reading to make sure, let's start on the same page. Let's make sure we're talking about the same things. So that was my heart in it. Just looking at terms um, such as embryo, you know, you check the definition for embryo out and you're talking about from fertilization to about two months of development in the womb. Fetus, on the other hand, takes over at that two month interval and runs through birth. And so just understanding that, looking at the difference between therapeutic abortion and abortion that is contemplated because of some risk to the mother versus the, the elective abortions, which is really where our culture is. You can have an, an abortion for any reason at all. So just, Defining those terms and walking through it, I think, was important. So if you if you don't mind, walk us through sort of the the logical progression of the book. Where do you begin? What steps do you take throughout the book to to make your case? Well, I, I really start with just setting that background, you know, starting, as you said, with the definitions. What what is it that um, we're talking about laying that? Then look at the historical background. You mentioned that already, how it developed through history. You know, really the first sort of uh, push for legalized elective abortions was in the, the Greek world. And um, and even there, it wasn't common. It wasn't commonly practiced. 
Um, infanticide, sadly, was more common. But as you march down through history, that's one of the major arguments that uh, flawed arguments that pro-abortionists use is to say, look, this has been widely accepted. And particularly that's their argument in in English and American law and history. And the evidence simply doesn't support that. In fact, it was sort of recreated uh, on behalf of uh, getting Roe v. Wade passed uh, by someone who was up to his eyeballs in favor of the abortion movement and really recreated the history. And even in the Supreme Court decisions, you can see that that mentioned, and I, I deal with that in the book. So setting the historical setting, then I think for us as believers, the the most important issue then is saying, how did this happen spiritually? What are the, the spiritual foundations? How did we get here? And tracing this back not to you know, the Greeks, but back to Satan himself, yes. whom Jesus says in John 8, has been a murderer from the beginning. I mean, this is ultimately a satanic movement because he despises God, and because he can't get to God, he destroys the image of God in man. And uh, that started, obviously, with the first family, as we read about in Genesis, and it has been throughout human history. So just explaining Satan's role both in the attack on the Word of God, his attack on humanity, his attack on children, and showing how that has has unfolded over time and, and how he accomplishes that. Then I went to the flawed arguments for abortion. Uh, I go through eight different arguments that are offered as a support for abortion today. And as you said, try to be fair in representing what they say and then to to respond to them briefly, because the, the real thrust of the book, after I go through the flawed arguments, is to lay out the biblical arguments. Why is it that we believe that the scriptures teach that abortion is wrong? And I lay out six arguments from the scripture to say, and some of them have subpoints, as you know, that sort of develop that and fill it out, but six basic arguments that that explain why it's wrong. And then the final portion of the book is to say, okay, now that hopefully we're convinced of what the scriptures teach, where do we go from here? How do Christians respond to their understanding of this issue and what's going on in the larger culture? Yeah, and for everyone listening to us, I just recommend you get the book because when Tom gets into that section where he's making the biblical arguments, um, that that was the part that I enjoyed. I enjoyed it all, but I enjoyed that the most because Tom, you did that with the skill of an exegete, and that's what God's people need. They need to to take those to take the Word of God in hand and say, okay, what does God say about this? And you did just a masterful job of demonstrating uh, how Satan attacks the image of God in man and, and all of the rest. Just just a great job there. Um, what are some of the, the key biblical texts that that you do bring to the forefront as you as you walk us through that um, you know biblical perspective of the subject? What are some of the key biblical texts that you deal with? Well, I think some of them are the familiar texts that people who have any understanding of how the Bible speaks against abortion would cite. It starts obviously with the Imago Dei in Genesis one, how that is passed along uh, through procreation. That means it has to be at conception in Genesis 5. Looking at the, the Noahic covenant in Genesis 9 and seeing how because man is made an image of God, therefore murder is wrong. Then you come to the law of God and, and Exodus 20 and see that spelled out. And then the, the sort of application of the sixth commandment in terms of what happens if a child in the womb is injured in, in Exodus 21, I think that's that's a crucial text to walk through. Then you you keep marching through the scripture, and again, there are many, but but another key one would be um, Psalm 139, where David talks about what God's interface is with the that life in the womb and how he's at work, yes, using secondary causes as he does, but he owns that development uh, as something he is intimately involved with. And you fast forward then to other passages in the Old Testament, like Jeremiah 1, where you see God speaking to about Jeremiah in the womb as a person, yes. so defining personhood. 
you come to the New Testament and you see you see those same realities. You see the affirmation of the sixth commandment, both in the ministry of Jesus, in the ministry of the apostles, in the in the epistles. You see the affirmation of the value of human life throughout the New Testament, and and you see specifically the the reminder that God is the author of life and the controller and Lord of death, and He alone has that right. So I think just unfolding it through the uh, through the scriptures, um, those would be some that jump out at me. Some of them are familiar. There are others that aren't as familiar, looking at the nuances, for example, of, of how does God, um, how does he identify personhood beginning in the womb? Looking at some of the Hebrew words, for example, that are used of people after birth, Yes, that the Bible in turn uses of that child in the womb. And so seeing how in the mind of God, there is not a, a differentiation, but rather there's a, an equivalence of life before and after birth. And yeah, that so, was an out, that was an outstanding section, and and the reason why that's important, Tom, is because as as you note in one section of the book, one of the newer arguments in favor of abortion these days is to try to differentiate between when does life begin versus when does personhood begin. Can you talk about that just a, a bit? Yeah, no, that's um, that's actually been around a while. In fact, okay. um, when you look at Roe v. Wade, in a sense, that was the argument that that viability, that is when that child can actually live on his or her own outside the womb, is the test of personhood. And prior to that, that is not a person. But but that's one view. There have been a number of views of when personhood begins. They, the argument goes this way. Biological life is one thing, but at some point, that biological life becomes identifiable as a person. And the, there have been a lot of arguments about where that happens. And some who are pro-abortion argue that it happens in implantation. Others argue no. It happens at viability when that child can exist on his or her own outside the womb. Tragically, there are even some, including a man who is a famous ethicist at Princeton, Peter Singer, who's argued that that really personhood doesn't begin to self-consciousness. Wow. So think about when you were initially self-conscious. I mean, all of us have those memories, those first memories. Um, when when does that happen? And so basically it's a justification for infanticide. But you have this full range. When you look at the scripture, the scripture connects personhood with conception. Uh, for example, just one example, I think it's some 11 times in Genesis, Moses connects conception and birth as one unit identifying a person. So he says this person was conceived and uh, and then was born by his or her mother, by his mother or her mother. But, you know, when you look at that throughout the scriptures, God is doing that. He's connecting, and I give a number of arguments where he's connecting personhood to conception, not to some later point when, um, you know, humans have argued that that personhood begins. Honestly, that doesn't even fly scientifically. Mm -hmm. If you look at you know, Patton's uh, textbook on embryology, which is the leading textbook still on embryology across the country. Um, that textbook identifies conception as the beginning of the individual. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's, it's very clear scientifically and biblically. And I just think we need to get that in our minds because as you noted, it's, it is a huge argument today to for the pro abortionists to argue that personhood begins at some later date and it's okay to abort a child until that personhood begins. Um, when you uh, taught this to the church, uh, your, your church there in in uh, at Countryside, I'm sure you know every pastor has desires in his heart with respect to the outcome of it, the fruit of it. I mean, we leave that with the Lord, but th there's there are desires in terms of Lord, would you allow this to have this effect in the life of the congregation. So what are some ways that you pray 
um, the sermon series you did and now the book w- would would help God's people? I mean, what what's the outcome of this that you're hoping for and praying for? Well, I think um, obviously I would love, and my prayer has been, Lord, let this book settle in the hands of someone somewhere who is contemplating abortion and let it save that child's life. I mean, that would be, you know, more than I could ever imagine. And my prayer is that the Lord would would do that. And and more than one life, I would love that. That would be my heart. I think next would be giving God's people who are struggling with this issue because of the influence of the culture. And usually, as you know, in dealing with Christians, most Christians reject abortion as a whole. But a lot of the difficulty comes with the hard cases. What about those things that, that like rape and incest and, and a child who is terribly, um, you know, disabled in the womb? And that's obvious. And so just helping Christians think about those hard cases. Another part of what I prayed is that it would help equip Christians to really understand why they're against it. You know, I think the Spirit of God, uh, as Christians read the Scripture, as I yes. said on the teaching of God's Word, they they have this basic understanding of the value of life, the fact that our God is the sovereign over life and death, and they understand it's wrong. But ask them to really articulate and defend biblically why it's wrong. And I think a lot of uh, of committed believers sitting in good churches like ours will struggle to really articulate those biblical arguments or to respond to the best of the arguments that are presented for abortion today. So a goal was, as as is true for us as pastors always, to equip the saints, right? Yes. To equip them to serve not only in our church, but to be able to be apologists for the gospel and to deal with issues that they're having to deal with as they share it with others. At the end of the preface of the book, Tom, you, you gave a beautiful gospel appeal uh, to, to anyone who has committed the sin of aborting their child. And I, and I love the fact that you, you, you made clear that this is a sin. This, this is a sin worthy of death. And yet, uh, you you laid that out, out in a way that acknowledges uh, perhaps you committed this sin ignorantly. Perhaps you believe the lies of the culture. Yet it still is sin. And and then you you made a beautiful gospel appeal. Would you speak to to someone listening to us, to us today that perhaps they've been guilty of this sin? What would you say to them? You know, I would say to them that abortion is a violation of God's law. I mean, that's clear as you as you noted. If it was done knowingly and wittingly, if that person, if if you are listening and you took the life of your child in abortion, and in your heart of hearts you knew that it was wrong, you knew that it was taking a life, then biblically you committed murder. You violated the sixth commandment. But if you didn't know, if you bought into the lies of the culture, which is so common, it's just a piece of tissue, it doesn't matter then again, biblically, it's still a sin. It's it's criminally negligent homicide, to give it a, a sort of modern-day face. But in, in the Scripture, it's manslaughter. It's, it's something where you should have taken more precaution and you didn't. But here's the good news. That's why we have the gospel. And the Lord Jesus Christ came not for the righteous, but for sinners, for sinners like us. And, and our sins are different. You know, I've I've not been involved in an abortion, but I'm a sinner who needs the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And if you've been involved in an abortion, that's what you need as well. And the good news is that's exactly why Christ came. I love the way Paul puts it, you know, in in, in the pastoral epistles in 1 Timothy chapter 1. He says, this is a trustworthy statement. This This is a statement that was common in the early church, and I want you to buy into it that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And so he came to rescue us from the penalty our sins deserve. We've broken God's law. We deserve the penalty that that brings, which is uh, spiritual death, which is already a reality, physical death, which will one day be a reality, and eternal death, what, what the Apostle John calls the second death the final and eternal suffering of those who die without Christ. And 
And that's what we all deserve. But Christ Jesus came into the world to save people like that. He came in the world to save us. And so my appeal to you is to understand that Christ says to you, as he said to me, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. So the uh, the appeal is to recognize your sin, be willing to acknowledge that as sin and to turn from it, that's repentance, and then to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, to put your entire trust and hope in being right with God solely in the finished work of Jesus Christ, in his perfect life, his substitutionary death, and in his resurrection by which the, the Father accepted the sacrifice of Christ. Through believing in him, through repentance and faith, you can be forgiven of those sins. Scripture uses words like pardon, like it never happened. And even more beautifully than that is the truth of justification, that at the moment you believe, not only are you forgiven, but Christ's perfect life is imputed to you. In other words, from that moment on, God will treat you as if you had had as much respect for and compassion for life in the womb as Jesus Christ had and has. Amen. So, the gospel. Amen. Praise the Lord. Tom, thank you for that. Again, the name of the book is The Biblical View of Abortion, God's Heart for Life in the Womb by Dr. Tom Pennington. It is a tremendous resource. I would encourage you all to get it. Tom, how is the book available right now, and how could people get this? Yeah, it's not available yet. It will be available in January. It's uh, being produced as a hardcover book, dust jacket and all of that, so it's a little longer process than a, than a typical paperback. So it's, uh, it's coming in January is the date we're being given. Uh, there are pre-orders. People can, uh, can get a copy, uh, sign up to get a copy now when it comes out. It'll be sent to them. So um, I just encourage encourage those who are listening. If you, even if you agree with the um, the fact that the Bible is against abortion, and again, I think most Christians are there. If you struggle to articulate that, if you're not sure of why you believe that, then that's why I wrote the book. I, I want us all to be um, on the same page with a biblical understanding of why we should reject abortion. And it's also, I think, a great resource for people to give to others who are struggling with that issue. I, I tried to write, and I hope you sense this tone in the book, Richard, I tried to write it so that it's, it, it doesn't read like a, you know, a, a blazing bullet at, at the reader, but rather just to say, let's think and talk through this biblically. Let's, let's approach this together uh, and walk through the arguments pro and con and see what the scripture has to say on all of these issues so that it's it's the kind of resource my hope is not only will primarily equip believers but can even be the kind of book because it does begin and end with the gospel that can be given to someone who is not a believer and who's wondering why we believe what we believe absolutely that was the tone of the book tom um sorry to ask again but is there a place where people can go pre-order where would they go to pre-order the book they can go to the word unleashed. Okay. I, you know, I I should know this, Richard. Sorry, <laughs> um, I probably need to double check with with Lance, but um, I believe it is available on Amazon um, as well as a pre order, as well as uh, on our website, thewordunleashed.org. dot org. Okay, and when it comes out in January. Uh, here at the Straight Truth Podcast. We'll let everyone know again about the book, but uh, check it out on Amazon. Check it out on The Word Unleashed. Uh, that's Pastor Tom's um, ministry, his preaching and teaching ministry. And uh, get this book. You're going to benefit from it. And as he's just noted, it's a great book to pass on to someone else and help them uh, think through this subject. Tom, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you so much, Richard. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for your faithful ministry, and thank you for your heart for this topic. You know, I, I think y you and I are fully agreed that this is the heart of God, and therefore it's our heart, a heart for the unborn. Amen. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Straight Truth Podcast. Now, Straight Truth is listener-supported, so if you'd like to find out ways 
how you can help us to continue to produce this podcast, you can go to our website and find out ways to do that, straighttruth.net. At that website, you'll also find links to all of our previous episodes and our social media channels, so be sure to check it out. Straight Truth is a production of Walking in Grace Ministries, the preaching and teaching ministry of Pastor Richard Caldwell. For more information, go to walkingingrace.org.